When I started this channel late last year, I did so in part because I felt like there were so many Witcher videos I wanted to watch that no one had made. One specific type I had in mind is what we're doing today, a Witcher 3 ranking. I've always felt like there was a lot of potential there, and I'm going to kick this maybe series of videos off with what is likely the most difficult subject to tackle, that is, ranking the endings. I want to do this topic justice, so I'm not only going to be covering the three major outcomes, meaning what happens to Ciri, I also want to tackle the Blood and Wine and Hearts of Stone DLCs, especially Blood and Wine. And I'm also covering the relevant war aftermaths for each area, meaning who ends up ruling Skellige and who takes over the North. As far as Geralt romances and Yen slash Triss and that whole debate, that's ground that will be covered in a different video very soon. Of course, I'm going to be ranking each category separately because there's no point in comparing Hjalmar ruling Skellige to letting Detlaf live in Blood and Wine. Each sub-ranking will have its own section and criteria. If there's something specific you're wanting to get to first, I'll have timestamps to everything. Now before I get to all of that, I do have a sponsor for today's video, Atlas VPN, who are currently running a summertime promotion for just $183 a month, which also includes 90 days of bonus coverage for free. I did mention this in a previous video, but I personally use a VPN more or less all the time simply for the peace of mind. The internet is great for many things, but do you really want all of your passwords, browsing history, and that sort of information openly exposed to your ISP, or even worse, to a public internet connection? I don't, and Atlas VPN are a great and affordable option for those trying to surf the web safely. Also, from my experience at least, Atlas is top tier when it comes to convenience. One click and you're connected wherever you want to be, across unlimited devices. If interested in their summertime deal, you'll find a link in the description, and their offer also includes a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if for some reason you aren't satisfied after a month, you are covered. Thank you to Atlas for sponsoring this video, and let's just immediately start off with the major endings of the base game. Where does Ciri end up depending on a small handful of choices you slash Geralt made in the final third of the main quest? My standard here is really simple. How does each ending work as a conclusion to the series so far, a story that follows Geralt and oftentimes Ciri across nearly 10 books and a trilogy of very long games? Of course, I think each of the three endings have a lot of good things to offer, but there are only three and tough choices need to be made here. With that in mind, I had to put the Ciri as a Nilfgaardian Empress ending in third place. That might be a little shocking, I know many would instead put the depressing ending last, but for me, as a conclusion to the story of Ciri so far, and maybe this is all we'll ever get, if I'm being honest, the Nilfgaardian Empress ending is the one that works the least for me. It's an interesting situation, because in terms of gameplay and cutscenes, it's the most fleshed out ending with a ton of impactful moments. And if that were the criteria, I'd put the Nilfgaardian ending in first place. I really mean that, by the way, the individual moments in this ending are top notch. Unfortunately, I'm more basing this on how each of the three endings cap off a really long journey and sit with you later if you think about them beyond the surface. There's a lot that could be said about that specifically, but I want to keep this short, so the ultimate reason that I put this ending third just comes down to the fact that the Empress ending requires a ton of extreme mental gymnastics for it to even sort of fit in with series story throughout the books and games. I don't want to invalidate anyone's opinions if they've just played The Witcher 3 and love the ending for what it is, I think that's great, but something had to come in last for me, so without spoiling the books for those who haven't read them, I'll just say that fitting the Empress ending in with Ciri's full story unfortunately just does not work unless you completely wipe away a ton of established information about Amir and Ciri. Not to mention the fact that a major book character known as False Ciri is completely retconned in The Witcher 3, which becomes a much more glaring issue with the Empress ending. I will say this problem might be another unfortunate result of cut content, which has been coming up a lot lately with the more in-depth videos I've been doing. The character I mentioned, False Ciri, was supposed to have a role in The Witcher 3, part of that is even set up in the second game, but she was cut and we ended up with a situation where the more you think about certain things when it comes to Amir, Ciri, and especially Ciri as Empress, the more it just does not make sense with what we already know, and I'm not even mentioning the fact that certain parts of the books take place past the events of even the games, and Ciri as Empress does not at all fit in with what is said there either. I also have to say I've seen so many people in the community say something about the Empress ending that just isn't true. That being that if you tell Ciri about Amir wanting to see her, it's then impossible to get the Witcheress ending. This isn't even sort of right, yet I've seen it repeated a million times that the only way Ciri becomes a Witcher is if she doesn't know there's another option. In reality, the most honest way to handle the conversation where you either tell her about Amir wanting her or choose not to is to first tell her, and then insist she make her own choice. 
and when she presses you for just an opinion, be upfront yourself and say that Amir has plans for her, which you know he does, he tells you outright. Siri then reacts with disgust and chooses not to go on her own. Geralt, I'm fed up. I won't have others deciding for me behind my back. We ride for Velen. That's not even to mention the fact that you can take Siri to visit the Emperor and even accept the gold from him, and as long as the other decisions you make are positive and either Radovid or Dijkstra are alive by the end, Siri still chooses to become a Witcher instead of going to Amir. And keep in mind that during the time of any main ending, the Emperor is still alive and well, he only dies later if Radovid or Dijkstra are still in the picture. So joining her father is always on the table at the time of the Witcheress ending, even if the war isn't going Nilfgaard's way. There's even a situation where Ciri knows about Amir's plan for her and Nilfgaard wins the war, and you still get the Witcheress ending, so I don't know where that idea came from that if she knows her options, she doesn't choose to become a Witcher. It's not even kind of true, so I just wanted to put that out there because I see it repeated all the time. So I'm on a tour of the provinces with a small swarm of advisors. Which essentially means they take turns lecturing me while I follow them about scribbling notes. Okay, moving up, I have what many call the bad ending in second place. When people say bad, of course, they just mean it's depressing. Siri disappears and you're left with this gut-wrenching shot of Geralt having given up as a swarm of monsters surround him. This ending gets a ton of grief from fans. It's very dark and intentionally has a lot of ambiguity to it. Did Siri die or just choose not to return because of your actions? Did Geralt really give himself up to monsters or does he soldier on? The game then plunks you back in Kaer Morhen before the events of the ending, and it's sort of devastating. That's the experience I had on my first playthrough years back, and it was so effective. Of course, with Blood and Wine taking place after the base game, I do like to think that Geralt lived, and even before the little tapestry easter egg of the swallow flying from the tower, I had always thought of Ciri just choosing not to return for a while as opposed to just giving up and dying because Geralt made a few questionable parenting decisions, but it's the ambiguity of it that's so perfect for the world of The Witcher. I don't like to think of this as my headcanon ending for obvious reasons, but in terms of a game giving you an optional bad ending, I do think this one is as perfect as they come, and is the most in line with how things usually play out in this world. And you are afraid. You feel fear. You lie. I don't feel a thing anymore. At number one, and call me a sucker for a feel-good ending if you want, I have the Witcheress conclusion. Like I sort of said a minute ago, most of the time the Witcher universe just doesn't give the few good people in it what they actually deserve. In fact, The Witcher 3 is really the first entry that will sort of consistently let major characters have happy endings. And if there are two people that deserve a break in life, it's definitely Geralt and Ciri. I often see it said that Ciri in The Witcher 3 is just a whiny brat, and in my opinion, that is completely missing the point of what her life has been up until her and Geralt reunite. She spent years and years and years dealing with nothing but people who want her for their own means, or have plans to use her in some scheme without her knowledge or agreement, and Geralt is one of the only people who ever actually cared and wanted nothing in return. That is why those decisions that determine your ending have so much more to them than you might realize at first. I definitely didn't in my first playthrough because I had none of the context and I'm definitely not a parent. However, once you have Ciri's full story, it quickly dawns on you how damaging certain decisions you make might be when at one point, Geralt was about the only person Ciri could trust. With the Witcheress ending, Ciri finally gets to choose her own path with no pressure from anyone. Not saying that she would, but part of the beauty of this ending is that if Ciri decided one day she didn't want to be a Witcher anymore, Geralt just wouldn't care. I'm sure he has a lot of pride that she looks up to him enough to want to take on that mantle, but ultimately all he wants for her is to be doing what she wants to do and have the freedom to make her own choices. I just love this ending, and if you get the chance to speak with Ciri at Corvo Bianco, which is three years after the ending of the main game, she's happy and unconflicted. So, no regrets? Choice you made? Not at all. I'm doing what I ever wanted to do. Being who I wanted to be. So before we get to the DLC endings, I do want to quickly talk about the ruling outcomes in both Skellige and the Northern Realms. Skellige is a bit simpler, so let's talk about that first. There are three outcomes in total, Hjalmar, Saris, or Svanriga, who only becomes king if you don't help either of the Oncrate siblings. How I'm ranking these, and this also applies to the North, is completely based on how each ruler rules and what ends up being the best for the people of each area. I'm not basing it on the decisions or gameplay involved to get to each outcome, and with that in mind, Hjalmar kind of has to come in last. 
I'll be talking more about the Svanriga ending in a minute, but the reason I'm bringing him up now is because he ends up just turning out to be a better version of Hjalmar when it comes to being a ruler. You're told in the epilogue that even after the war is over, Hjalmar continued to drown his people in their own blood for years to come, raiding and pillaging for the fun of it while the clans continued to fight amongst themselves too. Is that Skellige tradition? Sure, but Svanriga keeps Skellige's values without being a strategicless hothead. I like Hjalmar as a character, but as a king, he's a step backwards, or if we're being generous, sideways, and is not the best option. Svanriga, on the other hand, who I've put in second place, but you could arguably put in first, is a king who most won't end up with, but is a surprisingly excellent option. He more or less represents a king who strongly believes in Skellige tradition, but doesn't have the temper of most former kings and sees where the Isles could be stronger. He ends up uniting all of the clans against foreign enemies, something no one else had managed to do up until that point, which does cost some lives, but the results speak for themselves. No one expected much of Svanriga, of Clan Twersech, but he went down in history as the founder of a dynasty and as the king who united all the clans against Nilfgaard. Now, in what is probably a predictable move, I've put Saris in first because that's my preferred outcome, but if we're just looking at how they turn out as rulers, she and Svanriga may as well be a tie. Saris represents moving forward with little to no violence, which granted seems a little unbelievably optimistic for the Skellige we see, but it's apparently what she manages to accomplish. She moves Skellige into the future, perhaps losing a bit of what makes her homeland unique in the process, but maybe that's exactly what was needed in a quickly changing world. What's the new Queen of Skellige planning? Um, to listen, learn, and listen again. Then we'll see. Next, we need to talk about the North. There are three, but sort of four options here, and Radovid surviving and Redania taking over all of the Northern Realms is really the only option that could possibly come in last. Under Radovid, all non-humans are outlawed and will be burnt on a pyre, and beyond that, everyone from sorceresses to simple pellers or herbalists will be cruelly executed. Don't kid yourself either, the list will keep growing, because once Radovid runs out of innocent healers to burn, he'll start pointing fingers elsewhere. Above Radovid, but below the top spot, is the ending where Amir wins the war, but comes to an agreement with Temerian diplomats, allowing them to rule their own country as a vassal state of the Empire, or as Toller puts it, The silver lilies will bloom neath the rays of the great sun. So I say were I a poet. In this situation, Nilfgaard takes full control of the rest of the Northern Realms, and also has a grip on Temeria, but at least there is a Temeria that hasn't been steamrolled by Radovid. By the way, this part of this ending is exactly the same with Empress Ciri. She's only being trained to succeed Amir, so it doesn't affect the war we're seeing in The Witcher 3. We don't actually get any concrete information on how she ends up performing anyway. Even in Blood and Wine, which is three years later, she's still being prepped and says she's not sure she'll stick with it. Though, actually, just between you and me, I'm not certain I'm cut out to rule, govern, all that. Thinking you might give it up? I can't say just yet but I'm not willing to rule it out. Anyway, the non-Empress Nilfgaard ending is the outcome I always end up with because I refuse to let Dijkstra kill Taller, Vess, and Roach, but that isn't what's best for the North, not even close. Of course, that's because there's an outcome where Nilfgaard is repelled entirely, and the other Northern Kingdoms are neither absorbed by the Great Sun or ruled by a bloodthirsty psychopath. This is also the rarest ending, the one where Dijkstra lives after Radovid is assassinated. I'd say that this is more or less the perfect outcome for the Northern Realms, or as close to it as possible. Again, I'm not considering what it takes to get there, only what is best for the people. Dijkstra is incredibly smart, and as it turns out, he's also an amazing ruler. We don't get a ton of information on how exactly he does this, and I'm sure it wasn't pretty, but Nilfgaard is repelled out of the North under his rule, and unlike Radovid, Dijkstra isn't a madman who kills innocents just for the fun of it. In the Witcher S ending, where you actually get to see a bit of Temeria under his rule, it becomes very clear that Dijkstra is exactly what the North needed, and maybe the only man who could have pulled it off. There wasn't ever going to be a true fairy tale ending where all of the North returned to exactly what it was before the war. They'd just be invaded again, even if that were to miraculously happen. But Nilfgaard being repelled and the kingdoms consolidating and strengthening under Dijkstra's rule is about as fairy tale as you can get, while still being somewhat believable. Don't get me wrong, Nilfgaard is not all bad relative to someone like Radovid ruling, it's much more grey than that, but an independent north is definitely preferable to the Empire consuming everything. You're a real son of a bitch, you know that? <laughs> it's why I'll make an excellent Chancellor. That takes care of the base game, and while I want to immediately move into Blood and Wine because I'm excited to talk about it, I do have to at least touch upon Hearts of Stone. 
There's only two endings, Olgir dies or you intervene and banish Gaunter for the moment. I feel like with Hearts of Stone that there's much more to the decision than the conclusion itself, and that's why I'm going to be talking about that moral dilemma in depth in the What Would Geralt Do analysis I'm working on for The Witcher 3, and I think I have a bit of a hot take on it. In terms of ranking the two endings strictly on how I enjoy them, I much prefer visiting Gaunter's mirror world and defeating him there. It's head and shoulders more interesting than just letting Old Gear die and the DLC immediately ending. Don't want a thing from you. Are you certain? I am capable of a great deal. Never been more sure. Goodbye, Odin. So I haven't talked much about Blood and Wine on the channel for whatever reason, and I'm finally getting a chance to do so here. These endings are also rarely discussed for some reason, and I'll just say, really putting them under the microscope was interesting. There are three endings in total, how you end up with each can vary pretty wildly, but things always end in one of three ways. I will say, surprisingly, this was the hardest part of the video for me to figure out the rankings. My criteria here is just how each ending works as a conclusion to the main quest of Blood and Wine, and to start, I have the bad ending in last place, meaning the one where everyone dies, both of the sisters and Detlaf. This ending is sort of frustrating, and I would guess it's the most common situation to find yourself in on a first time playthrough. I don't want to spend a ton of time explaining the half dozen different ways you can end up with everyone dead, but I think the easiest way to sum most of them up is that you'll always get the bad ending if you ignore Regis's advice. If you visit the Unseen Elder, which Regis begs you not to at multiple points, you always get this ending. If you don't and seek out and then save Sienna from Detlaf, but ignore Regis when he tells you he has a lead on the fifth murder victim, you again end up with everyone dead. Another way you get this ending is perhaps the most frustrating of all, and it's the situation where you do thoroughly investigate and discover that the Duchess, Anna Henrietta, was meant to be Sienna and Detlaf's fifth and final kill. You can do all of that correctly and then proceed to speak to Sienna where the last thing she'll say to you is this. I regret nothing. If I could turn back time, I'd not decide otherwise at any juncture. They all deserve to be punished. My sister most of all. That's not even to mention that earlier in the conversation she drops another very subtle hint of her intentions. She ought to know. If only cause you'll probably try to kill her again if she ever lets you out. I probably will. Where I'm going with this is that after all of your investigating, Sienna can still kill the Duchess right in front of you, depending on what journal entries you've read and how much you sympathize with Sienna both in the Land of a Thousand Fables and when visiting her directly before she kills the Duchess. You can warn all of Henrietta's men, as well as the Duchess herself, of Sienna's plan, yet when it comes down to the moment when they're going to give each other a hug, everyone suddenly acts like they've been lobotomized so Sienna can give a little villainous speech and stab her sister. The Duchess's behavior makes sense, she's naive and has a massive blind spot for Sienna. But in the scene where Sienna kills Anna Henrietta, everybody else including Geralt is just joking around as far away as possible, even though you just told them that Sienna planned to kill the Duchess. I must alert my men. Enlarge the Duchess's honor guard. Make certain Sylvia Anna is closely watched during the questioning. I'll see to it personally. If you do all of the investigating, the moment of death almost becomes funny, because what else was going to happen? Obviously, Sienna's gonna stab the Duchess, she just told you she would five minutes ago. On that same point, for some reason you never actually tell anyone that you just visited Sienna, and that she admitted to everything and said she'd still kill Henrietta in a heartbeat if there was ever another opportunity to. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that seems like an important thing to mention, especially before a meeting with Sienna. All you actually do is hand Henrietta the note you found during your investigation with Regis, and when she doesn't believe what she's seeing, Geralt just doesn't elaborate. When you're actually thorough and not just skipping huge parts of the investigation but still end up with this ending, in my opinion it feels forced and like they didn't quite have a conclusion to match your actions leading up to it. To give credit where it's due though, everything after the sisters die is amazing. I love the little quest where you visit the sisters tomb and can choose whether to put flowers on one or both graves, and I love that Beauclair actually reacts to Henrietta's death even after the main quest is over. There are multiple moments where you'll be doing some random side quest, and you'll notice that the dialogue has been carefully changed because the Duchess is dead. And all for the glory of her grace, the Duchess. Thought this was about a witcher and a coiffure. What's the Duchess got to do with it? Her illustriousness was always so very kind to me. My poem I've decided to dedicate to her martyrdom. In second place, I have the fairy tale ending. 
Honestly, this one and the everyone dies ending could be swapped for me, but I ultimately put this one in second place because, as mentioned, I'm a little bit of a sucker for a good ending and I'd have a hard time finishing any side content in a Beauclair where the Duchess is dead and everything is sort of depressing. This ending was the one I ended up with in my first playthrough, how you get it is sort of convoluted and it's a wonder I stumbled my way into it. You have to have certain information and then treat Sienna in a very specific way through several different moments. And you also have to recover her ribbon from the Flint Girl, which is what unexpectedly saves her from Detlaf. What I appreciate about this ending is how Geralt shows empathy towards Sienna in this sequence of events. Don't get me wrong, she is an awful person, but Geralt has dealt with another Sienna earlier in his life. She's one of the 60 women said to be cursed by the Black Sun, same as Renfrey from The Last Wish. And the big question with the so-called curse is, are they actually cursed to become monsters later in life, or do they become monsters because everyone treats them like one? Almost all evidence points towards the second option. That's not to say that Sienna is at all justified in her actions, she's responsible for many deaths, but I think all of the empathy Geralt shows that leads you to this ending makes perfect sense considering his past. He's stern but fair in every interaction. There's nothing she could say to change what she did to me, to justify it. Maybe, but there's nothing out there to justify what you did to her and all Toussaint. Yet Anna Henrietta hasn't given up on you. I also really enjoy the conversation Sienna and Henrietta have in this ending. It explains a lot, but again, still doesn't come close to excusing much of her behavior. When it comes down to it though, how things wrap up here is just a little too sweet for me after all Sienna was responsible for. I get it, Blood and Wine is very fairy tale in many ways, but Sienna faces absolutely no consequences in this ending, and the only way you can end up with it is in a situation where it's known by far too many people that she was planning to kill the Duchess. When you say it, everyone around you hears, and there's no way it wouldn't get out to the wider world, and many others already know she was responsible for the other deaths around Toussaint. To get to the fairy tale situation, everyone just has to make a million concessions to Sienna, and then she gets to walk free after her many, many crimes. I really do wish there was a more grey version of this ending where Sienna sees her mistakes for what they are, but still has to answer for what she's done. In terms of what my preferred ending is for a standard playthrough, I do tend to go with the fairy tale ending just because I like the Duchess, and in the other two endings, she either hates you to some degree or is dead. That said, what I think is the best, most well-written ending that is just about perfect in its bittersweetness, and call me crazy or a contrarian if you want, but I've grown to really appreciate the ending where Detlaf kills Sienna and Dandelion talks you out of prison and a possible death sentence. I think it's the most well-thought-out ending by far, it's just about perfect. This is also the only situation where you can potentially let Detlaf live. In every other scenario, he just attacks you even if you try to reason with him. I personally think he deserves to die considering he murdered hundreds of innocents because he was basically just throwing a fit, and also to me he seems much too powerful and dangerous to also be so easily manipulated. Anyway though, I'm more focused on the ending itself. Anna Henrietta throws a fit because Sienna is dead, you're thrown in prison but Dandelion comes to the rescue. He has a lot of history with the Duchess, and the second he heard you were in trouble, he took off to Toussaint. That right there is Dandelion, and it's part of why I love this ending. It's really the only point in The Witcher 3 where you actually get to see why he and Geralt are such good friends. The two versions of this ending both have a lot to offer in their own right, too. In the version where you spared Detlaf, it makes Dandelion's feat of talking you out of prison even more impressive, because it feels very grim up until that point. I do prefer the version where you kill Detlaf because I think he deserves to die, as I said, but that's also the more bittersweet version of this ending. You're not hated, everyone acknowledges the only reason you're in prison is because Anna Henrietta is throwing a fit, and Dandelion not only talks you out of a lengthy sentence, but also convinces the Duchess to give you most of your contract reward because you did what you could. You can then investigate with Regis and let Henrietta know that she was meant to be the final victim in Sienna and Detlaf's murders. It's a bit of a heartbreaking scene because she lashes out at you, but only because she knows it's true. I should never believe she did this. She was not capable. This is an outrage, Dandelion. Tell him it's not true. Tell him it's a dirty lie. I find that people discuss the base game endings all the time, but Blood and Wine, not so much. It might be because it's a situation where the main quest really isn't even the star of the DLC. It's the new area and all of the side content that people talk about the most. That is it for today though. If you enjoy Witcher content, feel free to subscribe. We are getting so close to 50,000 subscribers. And also, if you enjoyed the video, consider leaving a like as it really helps to get these videos out there. Also, if you're interested in further supporting the channel and some extra content, you can find the channel's Patreon in the description. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one.